Good morning and welcome to worship here at the Little Home Church by the Wayside. Today is the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, actually the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, and it is Communion Day. So we send all our love to those watching us online as well. You're an important part of our church community. You may want to pause the recording for a minute and get some communion elements so that you can participate with us later in the service. You can always follow us on Facebook and Instagram as well. We are an open and affirming church. Folks from all walks of life, regardless of race, sexuality, or any other perceived differences, can always find a place here at our table. You are important to us. Please fill out a visitor's card today. If you're visiting for the very first time with us, drop it in the offering baskets as they go by later this morning. This is also our rally day. And I'll talk about that um, right now for just a second. Rally day for us as a congregation is just um, a kickoff for the fall. And back in Parish Hall when we have our fellowship time, um, today is like a barbecue. We just have hamburgers and hot dogs. Mike and Mary have agreed to grill for us. And um, there's a ton of food here and sodas and waters and things all iced and ready to go. And so we're going to just have a little barbecue afterwards, but there'll be tables set up. There is a table set up. Lori has done an amazing job getting us in order for Rally Day this week. Um, and the ministry chairs will be seated at the tables, and it's a chance to consider signing up to become um, a part of one of the ministries of the church. And the, the committee chairs will be seated at their stations, and they can answer any questions you may have about that. Um, and so we invite everybody to think about becoming um, a member of one of the church ministries today. I want to thank Rose for being our pulpit associate. She's actually chair of evangelism now. Ushers are Bill and Mary. The beautiful flowers on the altar today are um, in memory. Uh, oh, good Lord. <laughs> I'm going to say this now, just a disclaimer. It was two weddings and a funeral weekend. Um, <laughs> so we'll go with it here. Uh, the, the flowers are in honor. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra, of your birthday, and we celebrated that last night as well, so happy birthday to you once again. You're welcome. Uh, coming up this week, on Monday, Human Resource Committee, HRC, meets at 6 o'clock, I believe in my office. At 7 o'clock, we have a TPERC meeting on Zoom, and there's a bell choir rehearsal, is there, tomorrow night as well? Yes, okay. Uh, Wednesday, 10 o'clock, we have Bible study. It's continuing our study in Romans in the pastor study or on Zoom. Thursday night is on Zoom only, a book and a prayer club, and they're doing the book Lessons in Chemistry. If you haven't read it, um, uh, you could just join in on the Zoom and then read it later, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book uh, by Bonnie Garmus. Friday and Saturday coming up in Sycamore is the T-Perk Summit, so some of us will be headed out to Sycamore for that. And Saturday morning is also the Men of LHC Breakfast. Looking ahead to next week, Church Council on Monday night at 6.30. Next weekend, the Men's Retreat, it's in the bulletin. Um, and SIS has a breakfast as well as um, a work day for the Symbols of the Season Bazaar. And Northern Illinois Food Bank is coming up, and we do need some signatures for the next couple months for that, for people to go and help pack boxes. The sign-up sheets are in Parish Hall as well. Looking out to the month of October just briefly, October 6th is our Blessing of the Hounds. It's a beautiful day to come and watch. Um, we have a short service. They ride the horses and bring the hounds down, and we bless them and have a wonderful outdoor fellowship as well that day. It's really a wonderful time to to be there, and in church that day we'll be, selling, uh, we'll be celebrating World Communion Sunday. October 20th is the Crop Walk that we're hosting for about eight churches and other organizations. And then as well, we're gonna have a little kickoff 
for um, the community house uh, that day. So again, we're gonna have a service in here and if the weather's good, we'll walk across the courtyard and have a kickoff for uh, the community house as well. And the following week, October 27th, will be Trunk or Treat. And Trunk or Treat will be here at the church again this year, even with the construction. With all of that being said, are there any other announcements this morning? We have an uh, event called Silent Serenity that the Park Commission of Wayne is hosting. It will be one hour of silent reading in the park here in Wayne. And that will help uh, happen on the 18th. It's a Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And our goal is to get 25 people to read silently in Wayne Memorial Park, which is the park just back here that backs up to the, the school parking lot. So, or the school park. So hope to see some people there for one hour of no devices and just reading. Wonderful. What a novel idea. <laughs> we have a very difficult scripture passage today and we're gonna tackle it as best, as openly and honestly as we can. Um, so we start our services always, we do have some visitors here today, we start our services always with a centering time. Our scripture reading that Rose will read is out of the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to read a verse or two that alludes to the story out of the Gospel of Matthew this morning. A Canaanite woman shouted, Show me mercy, son of David. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. But Jesus didn't respond to her at all. His disciples came and urged him, send her away. Jesus replied, I've sent only, I've been sent only to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she knelt before him and she said, Lord, help me. He replied, it's not good to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Be clear, Jesus called them dogs. A desperate mother and her suffering child, dogs, mangy scavengers, strays. He ignored her first plea, insistent she knelt before him, pleading a second time, and Jesus barked, you don't give the children's bread to the dogs. Again, be clear. He wasn't testing her faith and having a bad day. This was a ready-to-go insult fueled by genuine prejudice. Some Canaanite woman wants my help. I don't deal with those mutts. And she said even the dogs get crumbs. Imagine the pin drop silence. Just like right now. The mother, gaze once cast down, now staring directly into Jesus' eyes. Even dogs get crumbs. Are we less than dogs to you, saving sovereign? In that moment, something changed in Jesus. Moved, humbled, to compassion. He praised her great faith and proclaimed her daughter healed. Alongside her great faith in Jesus, perhaps greater still was her faith that bold, courageous, tenacious, that appeal in her humanity could turn his heart. And although no one should have to beg for crumbs when they're starving for the bread of mercy, her daughter was ultimately healed from her demons that day. And possibly Jesus was from his. May that be true in our service this morning. For whatever reason we are here today, may we find healing and be fed. Amen. Good morning. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship inspired by Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Holy One are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. Surround us, O oh God, like the atmosphere around the earth. We stretch out our hands and our hearts, reaching for your goodness and righteousness. Surround us, O oh God, like the atmosphere around the earth. Lead us on good paths and make us agents of peace. Surround us, O oh God, 
For this morning's hymn, 388 is the correct number. It's only words. And we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. The, the name of the hymn is actually Help Us Accept Each Other. join me in the prayer of invocation. Holy One, our Maker, we gather to worship you, to renew our spirits, and to connect as a community. Some of us crave a joyful noise. Some flourish in quiet contemplation. Others desire movement, while others need to ponder our thoughts. However we worship, we gather here in this place. We find you in the midst of us. In this connectivity, we know that your covenant remains in effect. May your spirit guide, empower, and speak. Amen. The first scripture reading is from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and 14 through 17. Faith without works is dead. My brothers and sisters, do not claim the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory while showing partiality. For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here in a good place, please, while to the other one who is poor you say, stand there or sit by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? 
but you have dishonored the poor person. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Please join me in the prayer for transformation and new life. Holy, Holy One, one we, we confess our tendency to exclude rather than, than to include, to form closed groups rather than open communities, and to prioritize comfort rather than embrace curiosity. Help us to truly love our neighbor, whether family, friend, stranger, or foe, as ourselves and with the love you demonstrate toward us. Hear these words of grace. Beloved, God's grace is sufficient to meet you in weakness, and yet faith without works lacks power, conviction, and life. Let our commitment to the gospel and a life with Christ be reflected in our attitude and actions toward those with different life experiences, identities, and cultures. Be open to the possibilities, wonders, and joy that the diversity of God's creation presents to us. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. How are you this morning? Good. It's a beautiful fall day. You've got your Dracula teeth in, Warren. What could be better? What could be better? And we're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs later, too. So that'll be a fun thing for fellowship. So have you ever maybe been on a team project in school or something where you started something and somebody else finished it? Or maybe they started something and you finished it? No? Not yet? At some point, sometimes you split it up and, and it becomes a process that it, that it happens. Sometimes just one Sometimes one person does all the work and everybody takes credit for it. You're learning. Welcome welcome to life. So this morning is September 8th is a special day. 520 years ago today. The statue of David by Michelangelo was completed, and there's a story behind it. Now, just so everyone knows, I texted all the parents this week and have permission for this. So you all know this picture, right? Ooh. <laughs> all right. Okay, so, so I've had a chance to actually see that statue before in person. Um, we've all seen pictures of the Statue of David. And an interesting thing about the statue is um, that actually right over here, it is uh, from the story of, uh, what do you think of with, the, with David as a Bible story? David and Goliath. Yes, David and Goliath. And so, He's got his, he's actually holding his slingshot over his shoulder. That's what that one hand is doing. So in 1504, 
that statue was unveiled, uh, was unveiled on September 8th, 520 years ago. Now, interestingly, behind it, 40 years, four decades before that, this big hunk of marble was taken out of a stone quarry, and there were some problems with it. And the church asked an artist named Augustino de Duccio, along with, um, along with later another art, uh, uh, artist, a sculptor, Antonio Rossellini, to carve out a statue out of that 19-foot chunk of marble. But because of the imperfections in the marble, they couldn't get it right. Nobody could figure it out. And so it set in a field for 40 years. And that big hunk of marble was just called the giant. Apparently they started on maybe the legs or something and the feet a little bit. But they just couldn't, they couldn't get it. They couldn't see how they were going to create that 19-foot tall statue. And so along came this young sculptor and artist. His name was Michelangelo. The church had heard about. And so they went to him and they said, hey, would you want to give this one more try? And so Michelangelo said yes. He immediately built a wall, four, four walls around the statue so no one saw what he was doing. And out of that came this very famous statue, David. David is the lineage from which Jesus comes. Oftentimes we say Jesus, son of David. And Michelangelo had the vision to complete what the other two artists just couldn't see. But they still got it going, and they get some credit for that, too. Michelangelo once said, every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculpture to discover it. And for another statue that he did of an angel, he once said, I saw the angel in the marble and carved it until I set him free. Well, all of us are kind of like that. We're big blocks of marble and stone sometimes, and God sees how wonderful each one of us is. And sometimes we see that in other people when we can't see it in ourselves. And it's our job to share those good thoughts and that love with other people so that we, we can also be free and be that beautiful statue, that great piece of artwork of life that God, God has made all of us to be. Now this morning is communion, so you guys are gonna go back with Emma for a little bit, and then we'll send somebody to go get you so you can come back and have communion with your family today, okay? Out you go. <laughs> the second scripture reading is from Mark chapter seven, verses 24 through 37. Christ heals a little girl and a deaf man. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin, she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. And when she went home, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech and they begged him to lay his hand on him. 
he took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to them, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. For the word in scripture, for the word among us, for the word within us. Thanks be to God. Be opened. This is the second of 12 weeks walking chronologically through the Gospel of Mark. When we hit Advent, December 1st, we'll be walking primarily through the Gospel of Luke for the next year. As the summer winds down and fall approaches, very much so today, the elemental themes in this week's readings, both the active character of genuine faith and the ever-opening outward character of God's mission are well suited to help launch a new chapter, a fresh start, precisely because these themes push us to ask ourselves and one another, what's faith really all about? And what mission are we on? It's the perfect message for signing up for a ministry for Rally Day. I'll try not to mention that again. <laughs> but I'm just saying. Mark provides an important key for interpreting this passage. In the previous chapters of Mark 5 and 6, Jesus is in Jewish territory. He heals a desperate woman and then goes on to feed a crowd of 5,000. And in Mark 7, today's passage, and then Mark 8, the next chapter, Jesus is now traveling primarily in Gentile territory. After he heals a desperate woman's daughter in this week's story and a deaf mute in Sidon, Jesus then goes on to feed another large crowd. The overall dynamic in Mark, whose audience was primarily Gentile, is the saving, healing, liberating work of God expanding in scope from Jewish circles outward, eventually including all people. And though Jesus has interacted with Gentiles before in Mark, this week's story is a decisive pivot point in this larger narrative of scandalous widening inclusion. Tyre and Sidon were both coastal cities in the Roman province of Syria, as well as historic centers of the Phoenician naval empire, an ancient nemesis of Israel. For Mark's early audience, these cities simultaneously evoked not just foreign, but also hostile territory. As we saw last week, Jesus had just declared with the Pharisees and the disciples eating with unclean, unwashed hands. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. In a debate with some religious leaders, Jesus doesn't condemn the ritual of purity practices, but instead he strongly emphasizes the importance of the purity of the heart. And this emphasis could cause some listeners to say, well, if it's purity of heart that matters most, doesn't that put everyone on a similar footing? In other words, doesn't Jesus' way of looking at things potentially open up the circle of salvation to all, Gentiles as well as Jews? As if to answer these questions, Jesus turns and heads to Gentile territory. In today's passage, Jesus is exhausted, seeking rest, and solace. He quietly retreats to a private house in Tar, but soon enough word gets out. And a Syrophoenician woman 
desperate because her young daughter is possessed by an unclean spirit, hears about where Jesus is and comes to see him. She doesn't knock. She doesn't wait and plead her case from outside on the street. She enters the house on her own and throws herself at Jesus' feet. Her sheer audacity reminds us of the audacity of the woman living with a hemorrhage back in Mark chapter 5. This is nothing short of scandalous in its first century context and also in its 21st century context. Neither kin to Jesus or even known to him, she enters the house and boldly makes her plea. What's more, she thereby traverses barriers set not only by patriarchy and other cultural norms, but also by religion, ethnicity, and long-standing enmity between peoples. She is Syrophoenician, a Gentile. He is a Jew. Jesus' initial reaction is in keeping with the old way of thinking. Let the children, and when he says let the children, the children means the children of Israel. Let the children of Israel be fed first, is how we could read it. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Come again. Did Jesus just call this woman a dog? There are at least two ways of interpreting this story. One is that Jesus is playing the devil's advocate, being rather dramatic to bring the Jew and Gentile issue to the center stage precisely so it can be overturned or at least be put on the table. It's an object lesson for his disciples' benefit and for ours. According to this line of thought, Jesus intuits that the women will insightfully push beyond the conventional view, just as the woman with the hemorrhage did. And so he cues her up to do just that by expressing the prejudice in its popular folk wisdom form maybe with a satirical gleam in his eye. But isn't it true that we shouldn't give the children's food to the dog? Isn't that what everyone says? What do you say? And sure enough, the woman turns the metaphor on its head. Even the dogs gather the table's crumbs, and the logic of abundance implies that God's grace, God's grace is for all people. Right here, right now. Jesus immediately concedes the point. And by the way, this is the only verbal fencing match in Mark that Jesus doesn't win. The nameless woman becomes an example of faith, a model theologian, an outsider who understands better than the insiders do. And then, as if propelled by the surprising reversal, Jesus goes on to heal another Gentile in Sidon. And then miraculously, later in chapter 8, feeds a large crowd of Gentiles. The gospel is now officially on the loose. And the Syrophoenician woman is a pivotal hero in the story. This tenacious mother who helps Jesus open up the circle of salvation to the wider world. That's one way to think about it. But what about this? A second possible interpretation is that Jesus is just going along with the conventional way of thinking of the day. And he ends up learning from his encounter with the woman. We thought of it in this way. Jesus changes his mind. And the tradition of how God changed his mind when confronted with Abra Abraham's insistence or Moses' insistence or other prophets' insistence. Asking for repentance for those naughty Israelites in the wilderness. Like every human being, Jesus learns and evolves. And the Syrophoenician woman herself, therefore, stands in that ancient lineage of lamentation and struggle with God, just like Abraham and Moses, 
She argues well, stands her ground, and she prevails. Like Jacob, she's not afraid to wrestle with God and insist on a blessing. Israel literally means struggles or strives with God. So which is it? Do we have to choose between lines of interpretation like these? I don't think so. In my mind, Mark's account is permanently open to them both. Jesus' tone of voice isn't specified. It could have been satirical. It could have been serious. And so maybe there's a third option after all. And that's to hold both of these interpretations open and confess that we don't know for sure what Jesus had in mind. But that either way, for her part, the Syrophoenician woman is a radiant model of bold, creative, resourceful faith. And either way, her story is yet another example of an outsider seeing and understanding what insiders sometimes don't. It's a theme in Mark that continues all the way to the soldier's cry at the foot of the cross of Jesus. Speaking of insiders, those lovely disciples, they still don't get it. After hearings and a miraculous meal in Jewish territory, Jesus expands the circle to include healings and a, and a miraculous meal in Gentile territory. To borrow the term Jesus used in Sidon, Ephatha, be opened, Mark portrays salvation as continuously being opened up, always moving outward beyond all attempts to contain it. Our cups are always overflowing, or most of the time, but too often we remain closed. Later in Mark chapter 8, we're going to hear Jesus ask the disciple this, do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? So what is the real nature of genuine and true faith? We talk about faith, we use that word all the time. How would you describe it? I'd say this, at least for now for me, in light of this story. It's not so much a type of certainty as if it's the opposite of doubt, but it's a type of courage. Faith is a type of courage. And its opposite is timidity, cowardice, and apathy. What the Syrophoenician woman demonstrates is genuine, bold faith, daring and insistent. It puts first things first, a daughter's health, for instance. And it marshals every resource available from wit to wisdom, insight to impertinence. It seeks God out with both vim and vigor and is unafraid to wrestle, like Jacob, to strive to struggle with God. In short, like those dogs under the table, faith is tenacious, living, active. As James put it, so faith by itself, if it has no works, it's dead. Hmm. It says Rally Day Ministry, sign up there. <laughs> this story illustrates God's active mission, the same mission in which the church is called to participate. Its characteristic mark is that it is always being opened, always surprising us, scandalizing us, even with its ever unfolding breath and generosity. And this raises the question, whether we admit it to ourselves or not, 
Whom do we fail to include in our working understanding of God's grace? Who are we closed off to? Those across the political aisle from us? Those in another part of town? Another part of the country? Another part of the world? Those who have done unspeakable wrongs? those who belong to another religion or culture, another set of values, other creatures in God's creation. In what ways do I, do we, need to hear Jesus' challenging, liberating words to be open? I'll close with this. I believe this story is a case study in how scripture is sometimes best interpreted in ways that leave multiple doors open. Uh, could be this, could be that. You can learn from both. So one of the commentaries that I studied this week introduced me to the Reverend Fred Craddock, a distinguished professor of preaching at Emory University and interestingly, he was an ordained minister of the Christian Church from rural Tennessee, which is one of the original branches of the United Church of Christ. So this person knew him quite well and said this is how he would have preached this passage. Now wait a minute, what's Jesus up to here? Is he pronouncing an age-old prejudice like a slow-pitch softball floating over home plate precisely so this gifted, fierce young mother can take her bat and knock it out of the park? Perhaps. Or is he bogged down in what his teachers taught him, as we so often are? Does he learn something from the woman in this back and forth? Does she change his mind? Is she the rabbi here, the one who will open his perspective a bit more? You know, later on, he says to the man inside and be opened, but could it be that Jesus only does this so the Syrophoenician woman has already done that for him? Perhaps. Or is there instead a twinkle in Jesus' eye, even from the outset? Does he know very well that God's geometry cannot and will not be contained to one small circle, but finally must become a great circle that includes all other circles? Does he in fact know this perfectly well, but takes more pleasure in her making the point, as only she can, rather than making it himself? He makes so many points, after all. Why not make room so that she can make this one? She certainly makes it quite well. And this way, not one, but two points are made about inclusion. Yes, but also about the power and wisdom of the supposed outsider, the foreigner, the enemy, the one who is supposedly second class. I don't know. I suppose I'll never know. But here's one thing that we do know. She sure did hit that ball out of the park, oh yes. And whether or not she opened Jesus' mind in the process, I'm confident she opened more than one mind among his disciples that day, at least for a fleeting moment before they fell back into the old fears and resentments. I'm even sure she'll open one or two of our minds here today, if we're not careful. Virtuoso of faith that she is, profile and courage, champion of chutzpah. Do we have eyes to see, ears to hear? Perhaps we do. Be open, she says, be opened. Be open, Jesus says, be opened. Amen. We come to a time in our service which we call joys and concerns, and we have a lot of visitors here today. So if you do have a joy or concern, please share that with us as well. 
I have a few things. I'm going to say it's a joy. Lori Hazeltine is sitting right over there with Jen. And I want to thank everyone in church for their amazing response to the meal trains that have been set up for Lori over the next several weeks. I'll say the name Joe Sterner. Some of you know him, some of you don't. He's a young man from our congregation, just in his mid to late 20s, going through treatment for leukemia. We want to keep his family in our prayers. We certainly want to keep everyone who was harmed by the mass shooting that occurred this week in Georgia. Ron, uh, Louis stopped in earlier this morning. We want to keep Ron keen in our prayers. Ron's not um, feeling particularly well. Some joys. Julia Martisowski, Brian's daughter, uh, married uh, Nassim Alassam on Friday night, officiated that ceremony. It was lovely. On Saturday, Nick sang and I played, and I also gave the homily for a dear friend, Ted Welch at Baker Church. And then yesterday afternoon, we had a wonderful marriage ceremony for David uh, Griffin and Sarah Reese, who live across the street. Uh, the ceremony was here in the church, and everyone was escorted by the Dixieland Band across the street, and it was a lovely celebration. You can still see the tent up in their backyard this morning, but I doubt that you'll see David and Sarah. <laughs> I'll make one announcement, and I'm hoping that someone else will make the other. But we have some new babies, which is a real joy. Um, I got a text this morning from um, Mira and Dan. So they welcome, at 2 a.m. this morning, Maeve Renee Louise Reed. Seven pounds, five ounces, and she's in perfect condition. And so she asked to be excused from sitting at her chair for congregational life this morning. So if somebody can put their faith in action there and sit there this morning from her committee, that would be great. I know somebody will cover it. And I think Brian's facilities chair needs to be covered too as well, so keep your eyes open for that. Are there any other joys and concerns this morning? We have one couple up here. Okay, Greg? Um, continue prayers for my grandparents and my aunt. Um, hospice is still going on. Um, my my grandfather's name is Jack. My grandma's name is Patricia, and my aunt's name is Ruth. Barb. Well, we just joined the grandparents club too. So Tuesday morning, um, Eleanor Wells Zamanik was born. Seven pounds, seven ounces. 21 inches long, and we're very excited. Excellent. Mom and Dad are doing well. Great. My joy is being a part of this congregation. I've been overwhelmed with all the love and support that you guys have been sending me through my troubles here, so thank you. Um, after all this joyful news, I'm sad too. Uh, I want to report um, on three deaths. One is a first cousin of mine, Brian Brendan Tully. Uh, he was an administrative law judge in Arizona. And then I found out that a neighbor of mine died back in April. So when you learn of things, make sure you share them with others because months go by sometimes and a grieving individual did not receive any you know, compassion from me. I felt terrible. Um, and then I learned that the very first um, uh, season ticket holder from the Cougars, a man whom I sat behind for years, Warren Drews, died this week um, in his late 70s, leaving behind a spouse and um, two children and grandchildren. So I'd ask for prayers for three. Anyone else? Oh, we have one more here, Anne. Um, a friend of mine who we've prayed for many times in the past uh, who struggled with alcoholism was married yesterday. And um, 
it's a different kind of a marriage. But anyway, we'll just pray that this marriage is good for everyone involved. My friend's name is Jeff. Anyone else? I'm going to, I'll, I'll end with a joy then. It is really great to see Monica and Pascal here today. Um, they aren't members yet, but um, Monica and Pascal came to church and then Monica's father became very ill in Germany and she has been with her mother ever since and, and got her through his passing. And we're so delighted to have you guys back with us. Um, it feels good to have you here today. All right. Did you want to say something? And then I, I think it's about time that I'm telling you personally how touched I have been with all the support that came through those four months. It was a rough time, but it's, my mom's doing okay. And uh, I'm picking up my life here with my husband and, and our son. And uh, yeah, give me a little bit of time to remember all your names. <laughs> It'll be easier with the choir, I guess. And I'm so happy to be back. Thank you all. And we have one more over here. I had received a call yesterday from a, a, a former church member. Uh, he and uh, his wife and Carolyn and I were good friends. And within the space of two weeks, his wife has gone from a vibrant, living a person to someone who's in hospice and probably at, at this point has passed away. So prayers for Dwayne and for Karen uh, as they uh, didn't really have time to figure out what was next. So love gently, love often, and never put, put things on hold. Get it done. Love. In light of the length of the prayer request this morning, I'm not going to mention everybody in the prayer. We've done that, but I'll have a time when we, we have a time of silence for all of these joys and concerns mentioned. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, many days we are like the blind beggar in Mark's gospel, sitting on the side of the road, hoping to hear the sounds of your coming. And we are like the Syrophoenician woman begging for the crumbs that fall from your table. Like the woman who was sick for so many years who reached out to touch the hem of your garment. Have mercy on us, Jesus Christ, Son of David. Have mercy on us when we cannot see how we will make it. Have mercy upon us when we are sick and at times when we cannot get well. Have mercy upon us when life hardens our hearts and makes it difficult for us to love, to heal, and to forgive. Have mercy upon us when persecution comes and we are misunderstood. Jesus Christ, Son of David, we come this morning asking for strength. Strength for this life and grace to represent you well in it. Holy God, there have been so many joys and concerns this morning. We lift them up to you at this time. We pray all of this, O oh God, knowing you are hearing us far better than we are speaking. We pray this as a community of faith in all the many holy names of God and in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a time in our worship service where we actively and intentionally take part in the support of the ministry of Christ. 
If you are a member of Little Home Church, we encourage you to continue your pledges and financial support, and if you are visiting with us today, we welcome your gifts as well. You may donate by cash, check, Venmo, and Zelle. The QR codes for Venmo and Zelle are listed in the bulletin for your convenience. For those of you who may be watching this on YouTube later in the week, the information is in the online bulletin as well. Please join me in the offertory prayer. Sovereign God, receive our offerings for the nurture and expansion of your kingdom. May they be magnified in the spirit of generosity among your people amplified so that all may do well. to shorten the liturgy this morning so I'll drop to the final paragraph of uh, page 5 we remember on the night when Jesus and the disciples had their last meal together Jesus took the bread gave thanks and gave it to the disciples saying this is my bread this is the body which is broken for you take it and eat it and as often as you do remember me in the same way, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We practice an open table here. Everyone is invited, um, whether you're a member of this church or not. We practice intinction, which is to simply take a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup, and partake. All are welcome to come.
please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving? Let us pray. We give thanks, loving God, that you have refreshed us at your table, strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, as we have been fed by the seed that became grain and then became bread. May we go out into the world to plant seeds of justice, transformation, and hope. Amen. We're going to ask that we just sing the first verse of hymn number 563. Before the benediction, uh, Nick will forgo the postlude today. Um, I would just say a few housekeeping things then for um, for Rally Day. Uh, chairs of uh, our various ministries, if you'll uh, find your table and your seats, and everyone can proceed through the courtyard to the parish hall and so on. And um, many hands light work, so. I know they're just getting the grills fired up and things like that, but if you see something that needs to be done on the food table or that in the kitchen, those of you who can help with that, help out. And please, everyone, stay. There's plenty of food and always plenty of fellowship in this place. So um, receive the benediction. Go in peace and live the church. As you have been fed, go to feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have been received, give. And as you have heard, proclaim. May the God in you, the divine image to which you are made, see the God in me and all of those who will cross our paths in the days that lie ahead. Amen. Amen.